and I, I was really stuck in this place um, for a really long time. One, I didn't tell really anybody around me. My family knew. Um, but at that time, I was running um, a company and I didn't want my employees to know. I didn't want our customers to know. Um, and so I kept a lot of it to myself. everyone welcome to the channel i'm dc today we are talking to a remarkable woman cindy kennedy now cindy had chronic health issues in going into her, her late 30s and in her early 40s was diagnosed with early onset of dementia she's had 12 brain lesions but since then she has gone on to completely change her health around she's now thriving health and fitness wise, but is also a co-founder of the Metabolic Terrain Institute of Health, which is focused on the metabolic treatments of cancers, along with uh, Dr. Nasha Winters. So this is a remarkable story. I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you soon. Exactly. Okay, so um, Cindy, just let's start with your story. Let's um, tell us about your health journey. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, uh, almost 10 years ago, um, I was just in my, in my early forties and I started to notice that I was having a lot of memory loss. Um, and really my short-term memory was having a lot of, um, challenges and I went to the doctor and went to lots of different functional medicine doctors as well as regular doctors. I mean, I started with, I started with regular, what we call here in the U S kind of standard of care doctors. Um, and the consensus was that that was just my fate that, um, I had went into menopause at a very, very early age, uh, in my early thirties and that the lack of hormones is what causes that to happen. And so I was put through the hormone routine. Um, and at that time I had teenagers and they were girls. And so imagine their hormones and then me being on hormones. It was yeah. not a good situation. It was like, uh, you know, I was like homicidal or suicidal, you know, honestly at any minute, those hormones really just messed with me. And I, I only did them for about three months when my, uh, when my, I think it was my daughter was, 14 at the time said, like, you have to get off of these. You're just not yourself. You're not normal. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a little afraid of your behavior. And so um, I yeah. got off of them. The other challenges that I had had was that I was um, not able to sleep. I had a lot of other things that were happening. I was suffering from a lot of anxiety and stress. And uh, I seemed to have a lot of panic attacks and didn't really know what was going on. So I just kind of went through the standard of care treatments. Um, I was on Ambien, um, they would put me on Xanax and, and that combined with, uh, you know, the little bit of time it was doing on the hormones. I mean, it was just constantly up and down. I was yeah. actually on the Ambien for about three years. And this was actually when I started going through menopause. So before um, my early forties, when I started going through menopause, I was started experiencing all these issues, which I think some of it was menopause related. Some of it might not have been menopause related. And um, I, I, you know, they said, take this for sleep. And I took it. I was actually on Ambien for three years. And thankfully, um, I was able to get off it. It's incredibly hard to get off of Ambien because once you're on it, you basically unlearn how to go to sleep and you can yeah. only go to sleep. It's like you take a pill 15 minutes later, you're out. Uh, what ended up happening, and I, and I want to share this story because I think we need to bring a lot of awareness for those who don't know the dangers of Ambien. Um, I actually, uh, one night, um, tried to go swimming uh, so I lived in a place that had, it was middle of winter. So the swimming pool was covered and my daughter heard me making noise and went to go check on me. And I was actually trying to jump over, uh, this like wall, which didn't really need to be jumped over. Uh, but you know, when you're asleep like that, 
you know, you, you try it. So I was trying to jump over this wall and she caught me. I had my bathing suit on and everything. And I was going to go jump in this pool with a cover. She yeah. was able to drag me inside, got me inside, but I was so determined to go swimming that she had to sit up with me. She turned the bath on and I went in the bath and she sat to sit there with me for two hours while I, while I pretended like I was swimming in the bath. Um, so just a very, very dangerous drug. And there's been a lot of deaths from Ambien. So I knew that I needed to get off of that. That was very, very difficult because you have to teach yourself how to sleep again. You know, it was really hard. Um, I did it. And um, then I slowly weaned myself off of the anti-anxiety medications. And uh, then I just tried to deal naturally with a lot of the things that were happening. Um, I dealt with my stress levels. I dealt with my mental, emotional things. I dealt with menopause and just said, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I went through menopause. I'm going to ride this out. Um, and, you know, why I went through menopause that early is really unknown. I was on a form of birth control that has um, several issues. It's Depo-Provera. It's a shot. Um, so I was on that. It could have been from that. I had some stress going on in my life at that time. It could have been from stress. It could have been from all of the things. Um, but it was definitely um, induced by something. It was just a very, very early age to go through. So then when I hit 40, I was showing a lot of signs of memory loss. And I didn't know if it was because of the side effects of being on Ambien and Xanax for so long, because they, they do have side effects. Um, and that is kind of in the literature that they can induce the memory loss. Um, and at that time, the doctors were saying, well, it's from menopause, you know, and then they tried to get me back on the cycle of hormones. And at that time, I knew I, w I would not do it. So I then learned about functional medicine and started going to functional medicine practitioners. And I would say that that was a good kind of like next step. You know, they did all of the testing for heavy metals. You know, I had mercury um, poisoning. So I went and did a bunch of things to detox from the mercury. I got out of all of my feelings, did all of those things. Um, then they were like, all right, we're going to work on your microbiome. So it was kind of a good step, but it really didn't change anything in terms of uh, the diagnosis. And I later then took some tests and was diagnosed with um, early onset dementia. And so the prognosis at that point was that I would uh, likely be in full blown Alzheimer's by the time I was in my early 50s and that there was not much that I could do about it. Um, so that was not a very settling you know, diagnosis to get uh, at that time. Um, and I also at that time had an MRI and the MRI showed that I had 12 brain lesions and they said, well, that's, you know, likely from menopause. And I had had concussions in my life. You know, I was like a typical tomboy, you know, I was pretty rough on myself and, you know, got lots of concussions and did all of the things. And so, um, you know, they really couldn't explain it, but they just said, you know, this is your diagnosis and this is what it is. And there's really nothing you can do. Um, to come back from that. So, yeah, I mean, it was a very, very hard diagnosis to get at the time, especially I had just raised children and now they're kind of creating their stories and their lives and their journeys. And here I am thinking, well, I, I'm not going to get to enjoy that for very long, you know? And I was That'd also- incredibly difficult. It's just, uh, I think it, difficult at any age, but it's so young Yeah. Um, to, and it's always the same line, isn't it? So there's nothing you can do about it. Um, yeah. You know, one question though: What was when you were when you decided to go through hormone uh, replacement therapy because of lack of hormones? What was your diet like? What was my what? Your diet. Oh, standard American diet. I mean, I would say that um, I, I, you know, very always tried to be fit, always tried to be thin. 
And so I was very focused on low fat. Um, I kind of lived my entire life on a low fat diet. I was always chasing weight, you know, just I think a lot of us as females do, we're always chasing the, the weight train and trying to make sure that, you know, we're a certain size and fitting into our clothes and doing all of those things. And what I knew was that low fat. I also did know that carbs played a role because when Atkins first came out, um, and I removed carbs and it kind of was going down the Atkins train. I did pretty well on that. So I knew carbs played a little bit of a role, but I definitely stayed away from um, fat. So I was like low carbs, low fat. Um, you know, I would just sit there and eat raw broccoli and just try to like pray that I, you know, <laughs> can't wait. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I had, I didn't have a lot um, other than, what the way that I looked at health was in caloric restriction, staying skinny and working out excessively. Um, yeah. And so I did, I did a lot of marathons and running and just different events. I was an, uh, a kickboxer. I did a lot of uh, like Muay Thai and different types of um, physical activity for many, many years. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds like my story too. A lot of chicken, skinless chicken breasts. Yes. Yeah very low fat, lots of uh, broccoli and, uh, you know, veggies and that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah. and you know how that ended up too. So it's the same thing. Yeah. 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 As soon as you said, you know, lack of hormones, I'm thinking, yeah, low fat diet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, low fat. And I will say like growing up, um, I had chronic strep infections. Um, I probably had anywhere from five to 12 a year. Um, I could have them every month and they were always treated with antibiotics. Um, and so by the time I was, you know, 18, I probably had, you know, over 50 rounds of antibiotics. And then when my uh, daughter was born, she, um, at about one, she started getting chronic strep. So then the two of us just kept passing it back and forth to each other. So, you know, we were just on that antibiotic train for many, many years. Um, and so I, I think I suffered, you know, just in general from everything, complete microbiome depletion. I think that's still something that I deal with. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was like, whatever you could do wrong the first 20 years of your life, I probably did it. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that completely. But that's in the education as well. The uh, everything around us, you know, if you feel sick, go see a doctor, take a pill, eat, you know, stick to a low fat calorie uh, restricted diet, and it just messes you up completely. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's just, you know, I just interviewed Dr. Uh, Robert uh, Lufkin actually yesterday. Uh, he wrote the book, uh, Lies I Taught in Medical School. Um, very interesting. Mm, and, I have not read that and I have that on my list. Yeah. Um, he sent it to me. It's a really, really good book. Um, and, you know, each, each chapter, you know, the first chapter that starts with, you know, I, I did everything right and I still almost died, you know. And it, you're right from the start. That's exactly, I mean, he, he was the same. And, it, and this is the thing that he's actually a professor teaching in a medical school and he's thinking the same thing. It's, it's uh, stick to a low fat calorie restrictive diet. His mother, in fact, was a dietitian. Yeah. And he ended up with four different diseases that threatened his life as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, and, and that's the problem with this generational, um, you know, generationally, we are passing this forward. Um, so, you know, I did all of this uh, and then, you know, and look, I don't blame myself. Um, I didn't know any better. As an adult, I started to be able to connect the dots with the things that I was doing and the outcomes that I was having. And that's kind of when my perspective yeah. changed. But when my daughter was born, um, she was, uh, like I talked about the chronic um, infections, chronic strap. Um, and then when her daughter was born, well, one after her, after she had her daughter, she was really sick for the first year, in and out of the hospital, been septic, um, had a number of different problems. And then her daughter is the peanut allergy kid, you know, is the child that, you know, is constantly bleeding from her arms and, you know, behind her legs because 
she's so depleted in nutrients. You know, like if you think about, and I, I always kind of just jokingly say to, to my kids that their children are my children, but uh, because, you know, I was carrying the egg of that child. And so not only am I damaging the eggs that I'm carrying, but the eggs that they carry. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, this generational trauma that ends up happening. And when we yeah. look at, kids today that are in their 20s and younger children, they're sick. They're a very, yeah. very sick population. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And you can see it. It's not like uh, it's this uh, ridiculous sort of culture at the moment where, they, you know, um, we have to accept being sick, basically, like uh, fit, you know, healthy at any size or any weight sort of thing. And at the moment, no one's healthy at any size. You know, and you can see that the, um, the, the, the person's metabolic health, just look at them. Yeah. You know, they're either obese or you can see their, their skin color even. Yeah. You know, it was the same for me when I was, before I was diagnosed, my, my wife would tell me that I, was, I looked gray. I, you could, I was almost transparent. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so you can see yeah. it. You can see, you can see when people look gray, when people look yellow, um, you know, big signs are when people have bumps on their skin or they have, you can see it in their face. You can see discoloring, um, bags under the eyes, um, hair loss, you know, yeah. a lot of hair loss. I mean, you look at a lot of people and you can see right through their scalp, even women who, you know, predominantly didn't have hair loss issues and young women, you know, very, very young women, you can see it. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, it's, um, it, you know, it, the common line, like you said, the doctors, is, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just the way and we've been convinced that as you get older, you just get sicker and you, you just basically from the time you're a teenager, you're just going downhill. Um, it, it's completely untrue. Um, so, you know, like, yeah, you were in your early 40s and you've been diagnosed with early onset, uh, early onset of dementia. That's not right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not right. And and I I was really stuck in this place um, for a really long time. One, I didn't tell really anybody around me. My family knew. Um, but at that time I was running, um, a company and I didn't want my employees to know, I didn't want our customers to know. Um, and so I kept a lot of it to myself, um, for fear that it would ruin my career and look, face it, like I wasn't at the retirement age, I couldn't retire. Um, you know, I, I, that wasn't an option. So I really just had to keep it under the wraps, but people would say things like, I, we just talked about this yesterday or, you know, wait, we just went to this meeting and did this. And I was like, I mean, I just had no um, recollection. I mean, I would lose entire days. I wouldn't remember the day before. And so I got really, really good at like taking deep notes and dating my notebook and always like I'd wake up in the morning before I'd get my day started. And I would look at the notes from the day before. So if there was anything I needed to remember, I could. You know, and I just was just really in a self-preservation mode of like not trying, trying not to look like an idiot. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Um, it, it's very difficult to, especially in that situation. Um, it's very difficult to actually confide in anyone. You know, uh, just what's happening, and it's it's very. Um, I mean, most people don't really want to talk about this stuff either. Uh, so it's it's kind of hard to get your head around you know what's happening as well like you're in this situation and you, all you're trying to think of is a way out you know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so and I, so what, I'll say I also blamed myself like lifestyle choices right. that I had made you know um, when I had read about depo and the shot and some of the side effects of that I was like why didn't I look into that more before I did it and then um, when I started reading all of the side effects of Ambien and um, Xanax and then I started reading 
all of those, I was like, why did I do this? You know, how can you just be so careless and reckless and, you know, just put these things in your body and not even pay attention. Um, and I, it took me a while to process through that shame. Um, and it took me a while to stop blaming myself. Yeah. Well, see, that's the thing too, is, um, I mean, we always think, you know, I, I was the same. It's like, how, how did I let this happen? How, you know, I, I thought I was doing everything right. But the thing is, you also, we're, we're sort of conditioned to trust, you know, people, you know, like doctors. You know, if, if, doctor, if a doctor prescribes you a drug, you think, well, that's for, it's going to help you. This is for your better, this is, you know, to help you improve your health. Um, but, you know, I think in the last few years, people would have hopefully woken up to the fact that, you know, a lot of the times doctors don't even know what's in these drugs and they just prescribe them anyway. They have no idea what's going on with them. So Yeah. Or yeah. they're thinking it's better than the alternative, right? Yeah. And also they get people like, you know, complaining. I'm sure I was complaining, like, I can't sleep, help me, you know. And they think doctors naturally go into medicine because they want to heal, you know. Yeah. Um, and so when somebody's complaining, we have we want to be problem solvers. And so they have a tool, they're like, take this, you know, oh, I just made her happy, you know. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, Dr. Luskin, he was, uh, he's, one of his favorite quotes was from a medical professor back in the late 1800s, and it, it, it goes something like, um, at a graduation speech, he said, 50% uh, of what we just told you is, is going to be proven completely wrong. And the problem is we don't know which 50%, you know? Yeah. Um, and that was back then, you know, uh, nothing has changed, you know, really. Um, maybe things have gotten worse, actually. So, yeah, uh, you know, the, the corruption and food and, and things like that. So, so what was the next step for you then? You've been, you know, you must be absolutely devastated, you know, early 40s and early onset of dementia. What happens next? Yeah. Uh, well, the good thing is, is podcasts started becoming popular. Um, and, you know, people started going on podcast researchers and doctors. And at that time, I was doing a lot of training for marathons and stuff like that. So I would always just pop in a podcast um, and do my runs. And um, there was, and I can't remember who I, I heard first, I think it might have been Dom Diagostino when some of his work first started coming out about ketone bodies. Um, and the fact that it, they could have some some potential benefits um, to the brain. And so I was like, okay, ketone. And then he was talking about ketogenic. I was like this ketogenic thing, but really it was the beginning kind of his, of his research. Um, there wasn't a lot of information about it. So I started following the epilepsy community because the epilepsy community had pra been practicing a ketogenic diet, you know, since the forties. And I thought, all right. And at this point I had my regular doctor, my functional medicine doctor, and I had went to them and said, all right, um, I am going to go on a ketogenic diet. And they were like, what's that? And I explained it, I'm gonna eat all this fat. And they were like, you're absolutely crazy. And I said, look, all I need you to do is support me in this for 90 days. I, I, you know, I might gain a hundred pounds. I might raise my cholesterol, um, but I can do anything for 90 days without killing myself. That was kind of my thought process at the time. And also I was also diagnosed with um, osteoporosis. And again, they kept coming back and saying that that was due to the hormones, right? So because I wasn't making the hormones, then of course my bones were suffering. And so I, they were like, well, kind of concerned about that. What if it made it worse? And I was like, 90 days, just support me. I didn't know how to read labs at that time. I didn't know how to look at any of that. I was just like, what labs do we need to run? And I'll get them tested. And so um, they both agreed and um, I started, I went on the ketogenic diet. Now in the first two weeks, dramatic, dramatic difference in how I felt, how I looked. I think after about the first week I went into work and I was like doing this presentation and they were just like, whoa, where did you come from and where have you been? Because 
I, I mean, from how I was presenting to them, they felt like I was a completely different person after a week. Um, not to mention the fact that I started looking younger, like almost immediately. And I just, I felt absolutely great. Um, and then went back. I, so I stayed on it for 90 days. No problem. It was the easiest thing I'd ever done because um, I was following such a rigid macronutrient plan that I just kept track of everything. And I was like, all right, all healthy fats, you know, healthy vegetables, healthy proteins, follow this, do the macronutrients. I mean, for me, it was just kind of a math problem. Right. And, um, it was incredibly easy. I actually lost, I think like 20 pounds almost immediately. Um, and I just felt amazing. And so that led me down that path after 90 days, there was no question whether I was going to stay on it. I mean, it was just night and day difference. I was a totally different person and my memory issues went away. Like, wow. like, without question, I just wasn't having memory issues anymore. But what I did know is that if I, you know, took a weekend off or whatever, you know, it would notice it start to come back. So here we are fast forward 10 years and I pretty much live that lifestyle, like an 80, 20 rule. It's kind of where I'm settled at now. Wow. That's, I mean, you think about a lifetime of uh, the wrong foods, medications, and everything that's leading up to that, and you just in three month period, how resilient the body is. This is what I keep telling people: like, after all the punishment that you've given your body for so long, it it yeah. really does heal very quickly. Uh, it's incredibly resilient. You know, your body, if as long as you give it the right food, it it does all the work. You don't really have to do anything to to, to help along as long as you give it the right food. It's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, and today, like I hear people say, oh, it's so hard. And especially if they're doing it, like from a weight loss perspective, they're like, it's hard, right? Because you're eliminating a lot of things. Um, but for me, I didn't feel like it was hard because of, you know, like you always see when people are out there, like in the wild, like living in nature, all of a sudden they want like liver and all of the organ meats from animals because they're literally craving it. I think my body was craving fat so bad that every single bite I took just literally felt like it was nourishing all of my cells and my body. Like it was just that drastic of a difference in how I felt. Um, and it became to the point where I just, I craved it. You know, it was, it was definitely not just um, satisfying and, and satiating, but nourishing. And I could tell, I could definitely tell. Yeah, I, I I understand that completely. I was exactly the same. Yeah, you know, my body after my transplant, I was literally craving meat. I was craving the fat, you know. And, and you can feel it, your body just soaking it up like a sponge, you know. Yeah, um, that was it, it's, an interesting it's, thing too. Was I had never eaten red meat because at some point in my childhood, I convinced myself that I didn't like it, so I didn't eat it, and I started adding it in. I was like spread me it's good i think psychologically i had had some um block with it for some reason but now i love it and you know and it's i the low fat. it's the low fat you know uh, narrative you know and you know i was i was exactly the same i actually convinced myself that i i didn't like the texture i didn't like the taste i didn't like anything about fat i became fat phobic you know mm -hmm. if i had a steak it was always cut the fat out and i, I was just paranoid about any fat getting in, into my food you know yeah um, and it just it's just the way it is and like i mean even the, the education is, is set up that way you know even in sports science when i went through college it was the same thing it's all about all my lectures were the same it's all about calories doesn't matter as long as you keep your calories cat uh low fat is the, the way to stay healthy um you know get your carbs you know, carbo load and all this sort of ridiculous nonsense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, if, I mean, if it's all about calories, basically, you know, if you, as long as you eat a less, you know, cap your calories, you could eat ice cream all day. It wouldn't matter. Right, you know, right, right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Looking back now, I, I think, how the hell did they ever, you know, fall for this stupid lie? You know. Oh. I don't like what they were telling you at the hospital, like, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. And you know what? Matter of fact, just don't have anything that has nutritional value. What? Yeah. 
It's insane. It's insane. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so to follow on to the story a little bit. So um, around, you know, I'd been dealing with this kind of diagnosis and looking for answers. And I start dating this man and he is a fireman who has just been put on disability um, and then was kind of forced into early retirement because of medical issues. And he had um, soft tissue disorders. So uh, what would happen is, you know, they'd be in the middle of, um, you know, they'd be at a rescue or doing something like that. And, you know, they'd be lifting a patient and his bicep would rip off. And he would, you know, go get surgery, normal rehab, and um, they would not release him to go back to work because he wasn't fully recovered. And so then the rehab would be three times the amount that it should be. And then finally they would release him back to work and he'd get injured again. And it was like stuff that, you know, here's this, this fit guy who spent his entire life being fit. Now, all of a sudden, He's he's they can't explain why his muscles are ripping and, you know, they're not healing. And by the time I had met him, he was, you know, somewhat just really suffering in chronic pain. Um, you can just feel how tight his muscles always were. And he would have a lot of the, the just him going from like sitting to standing. And he was in his mid 40s. Sitting to standing was like, you just watch him for five minutes and you'd see how much pain he was in. And at times I'd wake up in the middle of the night to like him crying in a sleep because he was in that much pain. Yeah. And um, I thought, and, and then, you know, just observation wise, you know, we would take a two hour ride up into the mountains and I have to like pack him a little food pack. It's like, why do you have to, you know, we're just driving up to the mountains. You could go two hours without eating. And he right. was on that regimen of low fat, you know, eat right. six to eight times a day, you know, small meals. And right. I was like, you really need to try this ketosis thing. And he was like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. You got to eat six to eight times a day, low fat, blah, blah, blah. Finally convinced him, I said 90 days. It's not going to kill you in 90 days. Just try it. He had the same type of transformation that I did. He yeah. it just, you know, a lot of the soft tissue disorder issues that he was having, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a lifelong thing, I think for him, but um, he does, he's now gone back to work. Um, he's able to do all of the things um, and, you know, he just doesn't lift a lot of heavy things, um, but he's fully functional where before he was not. And matter of fact, the predictions were that he would likely be in a wheelchair by the time he was 50. And wow. now we go hiking, we do all the things, he's totally fine. Um, so, I mean, there's so many different things that we are affected by, you know, just not getting the right nutrition for our That's bodies. Right. So when we think about the, you know, process that our body is supposed to go through every day for every calorie that we spend, it's all about minerals, amino acids, and lipids. And we're not, we're, we're trying not to give them any, we're saying, don't have a lot of sodium, you know, don't eat meat. Now we're trying to go this whole vegan vegetarian movement, like this meatless soy junk and don't have fat. Yeah. It's crazy. It, yeah. Uh, that's, that's the thing. All of these conditions can be basically put down to um, basically your, your blood glucose. Uh, you're eating too often, but uh, just the, the lack of nutrients because you're not eating fat, you're not eating enough fat. You know, um, this is what I keep telling people. Fat should be your priority. And this is where you get all your nutrients and, and minerals from. It's like, I mean, you've got five different organs in your body and your lymphatic system to absorb fat. That's there for a reason, you know. Um, and, you know, once I, that was one, one thing, once I understood my lymphatic system, because that was my condition, was my, in my lymphatic system. So I had to sort of research that. And I realized, well, you're supposed to eat fat, you know. And you actually, I mean, it's it's like we were talking about before, you, you convince yourself you don't like this stuff. But when you actually realize that that's what you're meant to be eating, I very much enjoy it now, the, everything about it. Um, yeah. So now you're, you are um, 
one of the co-founders of Metabolic Health, uh, Metabolic Terrain Institute of Health. Yeah. So how, how did that start? Well, at the same time um, that I was doing all of this, uh, learning about ketogenic and how to implement it, um, one of my high school friends, um, 10 year old daughter was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. Um, and actually it's not classified as a brain tumor, but it was on the, on the base of her brain. And, um, so I, and I don't know how things are out in Australia, um, out in the U S, uh, you, if a doctor rec makes a recommendation for your child for treatment, um, you have to do that treatment. And if you don't, then child protective services can, will come and take your child and, um, and administer the treatment to them. So uh, she had, the wife had come to me and said, hey, I heard that you've been doing this ketogenic thing and there's no way that I am putting my daughter through um, chemo and radiation. They said, it's not gonna save her life. It'll just extend it maybe six months. And they'd given her, you know, like six months to a year. And she, she had um, done enough research and, you know, watched some documentaries. She was like, I'm not doing that. It's not happening. I'm not gonna watch my 10 year old be miserable for the last year of her life. She said, will you help with getting her into ketosis? And at first I said, absolutely not. I don't know anything about cancer or childhood cancer. And she said, well, you can't do any worse than death. You know, she's dying. Yeah. So I said, you know, that's a very, very good point. Um, and so I said, yes, okay, I'll do it. And they were living um, in a different state than I was. And because they didn't want CPS to come take her and administer it, they actually moved to the state that I was in and uh, kind of went underground in terms of their jobs and stuff like that, just so that they couldn't track them. And that to me was one just very sad and disturbing that the family had to do that. Um, and that as a as a um, parent or child, you don't have any ability to um, make choices. So, and I, and I can understand also why that needs to happen, but to some extent. And so, um, so she had, uh, we started getting her into ketosis and she was having lots of seizures and the seizures just started to reduce and reduce and reduce. And she seemed to be doing great. Um, and we, but we didn't know because she wasn't really being seen by any medical professionals at that point. We were certainly not medical professionals. Um, we were just experimenting on a 10 year old girl. And, um, and then I had went, I started going to medical conferences whenever I was traveling for work. I was like, all right, is there going to be a medical conference in this state and city at this time? And I would stay over the weekend and go. And, um, I went to a medical conference in Austin and uh, there was this lady who was kind of giving a speech uh, talk there and she was um, also terminal brain cancer and was living past her expiration date. And so um, I kind of stalked her. I followed her. She was going to a restaurant. I followed her over there. I said, who's your doctor? And she said, Dr. Nisha Winters, um, she's uh, a naturopath oncologist. And I was like, okay. So I literally run outside, I call her parents. I said, you need to get um, Phoenix an appointment with this naturopathic oncologist out of Colorado. And they schedule an appointment and they get Phoenix in and um, they start giving her, Nisha, Dr. Nisha Winters reviews everything, all of her labs, all of her scans, everything, and um, puts her on a plan, puts her on a like monthly test so that we can track to see what's actually going on with the cancering process. And long story short, um, today Phoenix is 19 years old and no evidence of disease um, and doing well. And she's actually going to be pre-med. She wants to go to medical school and she wants to be able to help other children. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And what I learned in this process is now I've got a whole nother area of podcasts and everything I'm, I'm reading and, and listening to and all these books are coming out. So now I'm getting very invested kind of in the cancer space. Um, and Dr. Nisha Winters had written a book called The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. So now I'm learning that everything we've been thinking about cancer is all wrong. You know, it's not genetic, it's not fate, it's not anything that we can't be empowered with. It's something we can definitely be empowered to, to take control of. Um, and 
And at the same time, the things and the doctors who are aware of this are not covered by insurance. And it's extremely yeah, yeah. frustrating, you know, so while, while Phoenix um, is, is doing really well, the toll it took on her parents is significant, you know, just from a financial perspective. And of course, as a parent, you would do that over and over again, you'd make the same decision a thousand times for your children. Um, but you know, it, the system shouldn't be built that way. And so I had decided to leave my career at the beginning of COVID. Um, I had spent 27 years in the tech industry uh, as an executive working for um, just an amazing, amazing man, um, CEO who taught me everything about running and building organizations and, you know, uh, getting them, you know, to grow and all of these things that I was like, you know, I need to take this knowledge and carry it forward into the healthcare space. Um, so at the beginning of COVID, I reached out to Dr. Nisha Winters, who didn't know who I was, by the way. I just said, hey, I've been following your work and I want to support the efforts that you're doing. I want to start a nonprofit and be able to raise funds for patients that um, need to go outside of standard of care for treatment. Um, and so she was like, great, that would be great. She had written a book. And once she wrote her book, then if you got cancer and you picked up her book, you tried to make an appointment with her, the wait list was a year long, which is not great when you're dealing with stage four. Yeah. So she said, I need to start um, educating other clinicians on how to get understand the root cause, the metabolic factors that are causing people to stay in this disease process um, and the type of treatments that'll work and when they'll work and how to apply them and all this stuff. And so, um, her and I kind of went down this path of, all right, let's build this education. Um, and now that has evolved into we're building a tech platform. So to date, we have a little over 500 clinicians and advocates or clinicians, practitioners and advocates who have gone through our program. We continue to launch um, courses every year, two courses um, every year. They're year long programs. Um, we'll, so we'll just continue to grow that network. Uh, we are opening up a research lab. Um, we'll be making the announcements about that. We've, we're already in the space, just getting all the equipment set up. So we're going to do a lot of research around uh, therapies that are specifically designed to hit the metabolic functions, um, metabolic pathways, and be able to reverse some of those. Because, you know, we might have gotten there, we might have gotten into this dysfunction because of environmental factors in food. But once our cells start to go awry, it can be really hard to reverse those. So we need to be able to have the right therapies to apply. Um, and then um, we're also studying metabolic pathways in that lab. Um, and for all metabolic disorders, not just cancer, you know, autism, we'll have researchers that are, you know, specialists in autism in working with us in that lab as well. Um, and then we're also building a tech platform so that every practitioner that goes through um, our program can put all of their patients data in that platform and we can start learning from patients instead of the other way around, you know, where today it's all about single target, single therapy, let's evaluate it on 10,000 patients and see what happens. And we'll take the average from that and then apply it. Yeah. We, you know, today EMR systems um, or EHR systems, EMR systems, whatever uh, you want to call them, they do not take in outside therapies. So if you're a, you know, a medical institution, university, and you're applying certain therapies, that's the only data that system's collecting. Yeah. You know, but what if the patient's doing keto? What if they're doing fasting? What if they're licking a tree 37 times a day because they, they heard on a blog <laughs> that you should, right? That's fine. Yeah. We got to collect the data. You know, we need yeah. to learn from the patients and what they're doing. What are their biomarkers telling us? What are their tissue assays telling us? What are their genetics telling us? And how does all of that data look? And can we see patterns? You know, you you could be sitting amongst 10 other people with uh, lymphoma and all 10 different reasons for getting it. So why are we applying all the same therapies? And why are we treating it all the same? We can't. No, 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 that's right. You know, um, 
that's a good, very good point. Is you know when you, when a patient goes into a hospital and they're diagnosed, the last the, the doctors don't even ask what their diet's like. You know, that it, that it never even really occurred to them to ask what my diet was like. You know, uh, because I mean they have just have no idea when it comes to nutrition either, and the, the metabolic pathways. Um, and you know. That's the story with the young girl. That's incredible. And yeah. what her parents did to, to save her life is just amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw that a lot when I was, as you know, my story, going through treatment and I was in the Leukemia Foundation. I saw most of the people that were there were children. Okay. Um, the number one cause of death of all, all mortality of children in Australia is cancer. And they have, and generally speaking, um, children up to the age of 15 are the highest um, age group to die from uh, cancer in Australia as well. Wow. Yeah, amount of men. So, uh, you know, that's an alarming amount of children dying from cancer. And the same here, they, when they are diagnosed, the parent has no choice. Mm -hmm. They have to go through whatever treatment the uh the oncologist or the doctors or hospitals pre um, uh, prescribe yeah and, um you know i know what chemo is like children cannot handle that that kind of treatment and uh, it's the treatment that kills them you know basically a lot of times yeah, yeah. And, I, and i will say I, you know i don't know if uh the us is just a little bit more rebellious or maybe the same thing ends up playing out in australia but what i learned about in the us is that there's an entire underground network of um, parents who have pulled their their children out of the system and they are um, just doing it on their own and they're all collaborating and talking amongst each other um, about what they're doing. This is the treatment I'm giving my child. This is the, the treatment I'm, I'm trying. Um, we call it kind of this like DIY approach to cancer. And um, you know, it's sad because um, you want to be able to give them more clinical guidance and be able to teach them how to read labs and do all of these things. And you want it to be supervised. So it's just a really tough situation. But yeah, there's lots of different groups and online groups where they've just, I mean, people, parents just move off grid. I would do the same thing for my children. I would do the same thing. And, um, you know, we need to figure out how to support them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, once... Once you get caught in the um, the hospital system, it is ex extremely difficult to get out of it. You know? Yeah. Um, and especially when they have uh, the authorities, you know, sort of, you know, on the law side of things, trying to, um, you know, basically acting you know, like they're enforcers, really. Um, and, yeah, it's just a, a horrible system at the moment. It really is. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, I will say that there's a lot of really powerful stories that come out of some of those, um, like underground. I mean, there's so many children that are surviving and yeah. doing really, really well. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I think that the medical system is so incredibly broken, but the power of us as individuals, as we start coming together and speaking out about this and sharing our stories is really powerful and can make a huge difference. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, and it's, it's that making it that the people standing up for themselves and wanting demanding better health care that's that's how we can make a change so um and what a wonderful story that young girl like now she's pre-med i think how many people she's going to help as well you know because you just did that one just you, you helped that one child now she's going to go on and help hopefully thousands more yeah so um, that's incredible yeah and i and i also want to note too that um we have, uh, so we're, we have practitioners that have joined our program um, from 36 countries, uh, most um, English speaking countries. We have not done a lot of the um, translations yet to be able to offer in other countries, but we need more clinicians, practitioners, health coaches, advocates from Australia. Um, we only have one person from Australia that's taken any of our courses. 
and wow. um, we need more. We need more. We need to raise awareness in Australia that there is these um, paths, especially with the statistics that you just shared with children. Even mothers taking some of our courses and programs can learn the things that they can apply to their children that don't have cancer, right? But just trying to fix kind of this generation of us getting sicker and sicker and sicker, you know, we have to start educating. So we're building more programs to educate the general public. Um, and we just, you know, we want to, we want to be able to provide that education and that knowledge, and we want to be able to provide people with support and places to go when they are faced with this diagnosis. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a good point too. It's, it's not just about cancer. It's about everyone's health. You know, in general, um, we, we are a metabolic creature. So like everything, you know, obesity, whether it's obesity or diabetes or anything else, it's uh, getting your, uh, yourself metabolically healthy is about uh, being independent and having a full life. Um, so I think it's, this can be, this would be a good thing for absolutely anyone to do. Uh, follow uh, the Metabolic Institute of Health, um, do a course, do um, you know, anything you can just to, to be healthy. And like I said before, you know, it's not about accepting uh, people being you know, at healthy at a, a big size because at the moment no one's healthy at any size. Um, and and that's, that's what we have to get through to people. Yeah. There's a lot of toffees, right? Then oh, yeah. applied fat on the inside, right? We just, yeah. we don't really understand health. We don't really understand what it means to be healthy. Everybody says that they were like, you know, I can't tell you how many patients we work with. We have tens of thousands. And they always say, I was healthy until I got cancer. Well, yeah. cancer is a disease of the sick. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I was the same. I was healthy and got cancer. I was thinking the same thing. Like I, the, the the day I left Japan, I was I was in the gym before I went, you know, and, and flew back to Australia. You know, um, I was always fit, but unfortunately, you know, um, you know, decades of low fat diets and uh, you know trying to get as, as lean as possible, it's just it it destroys your body. You know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's basically you're starving yourself. It doesn't matter how big you are, how fit you are. You're basically starving yourself. You could eat, you could eat eight times a day and still starve yourself. You're starving your body of nutrients, you know, by giving it empty food. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So true. So true. So, what does your eating look like now, and what what do you prescribe for people? Yeah. Yeah. Mine, mine definitely follows, um, you know, where my biomarkers are at. I run my labs, you know, frequently I see what's going on. Um, healthy fishes, healthy meats. I'm all pasture raised. I I'm very, um, I'm very diligent about where I source my, my meats from, where I source my veggies from. Um, uh, there's a farm here that, um, they actually send me their residue reports so I can see, the amounts of, um, you know, glyphosate or any type of iodes and, and basically their, their residue reports are like zero, which is amazing. Um, and, um, healthy fats. So, you know, I just clean, clean eating. Um, and, um, in terms of our patients, it really depends on what their, um, biomarkers look like. And when I say biomarkers labs, we do an extensive analysis, um, uh, for every new patient that's onboarded, really understanding where they're at. Um, and most of the time, well, I would say all the time, it's definitely going to be low carb. Um, and most of the time it's going to be a nutritional level of ketosis, but oftentimes there's other things that may be at play depending on where, um, how the cancer is behaving in their body, has it metastasized, um, and what are the mutations, uh, you know, have the, um, have the drugs that they've been on the treatment that they've been through cause mutations that are making the cancer adapt and, um, take up other things. So, you know, we employ what is needed for that patient at the time. And then we readdress every month after watching their biomarkers. A lot can be, be told just through labs. 
not even needing scans. There's so many things that that we can be told um, through scans or through just looking at their individual biomarkers. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But the, um, I would say the most important things, the things that are consistent across the board is clean foods. You know, yeah. we run tox panels on everybody. And when I ran my tox panel, I had two things. I was flying all the time uh, for work and, um, you know, just eating wherever I could get food. And if, you know, you go at the airport and you can get a salad bar, great, get that salad bar. My glyphosate levels, which are like round up all of the ides, uh, was yeah. at the 95th percentile of anybody they had ever tested. And my level of airplane diesel fuel was off the charts. Wow. So, you know, we, we, ha we also have to focus on these environmental factors that are just introducing all these toxins. Once our body starts to metabolically break down, we can't process those toxins as fast. So my body was metabolically broken. Now I'm exposed to all of these environmental toxins. Um, so it's a combination of like getting me back to metabolic flexibility, which is what getting into ketosis did, but then also starting to implement things so that I could get rid of the toxins um, and get my liver the support it needed and, you know, all of the other organs, kidneys and things like that. That's a good point. Um, you know, when you're healthy, your body uh, does a very good job of getting rid of toxins. Um, but when you are metabolically unhealthy, and everything's starting to break down. It can't get rid of those toxins very well. Um, there are, th I mean, there are some things you, you can't control. You can't control a lot of the environmental um, sort of problems and impacts, you know, air pollution and uh, other things. But the things that you can control are uh, your food, like um, get as clean as possible, uh, as clean as sources as possible. And, you know, um, you know, while you're traveling, a lot of people think, oh, okay, we've got a salad bar. Yeah, salad's good. It's got to be healthy, right? It's veggies and fruit. But no, it, it's not. It's um, yeah. like, you know, a lot of that food is, like you said, you know, covered in glyphosate and, and many other pesticides. It's not just, uh, you know, there's so many things that are on these fruit and vegetables now. Um, they're even genetically modified fruits now to, to make them sweeter. Um, and a lot of the vegetables are just man-made crops and yeah, you know, things like that too. So, um, yes. yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. And another thing is that carbohydrates in particular are very high in um, deuterium. Yeah. And, and water's polluted. Um, so, like, you got to find the best source, source of water. If you're at home, like, you, you know, filtering your water, make it as clean as possible, uh, remineralize it, uh, make sure you have a good source of minerals like salt. Um, yeah, and you know these, um, you know grass. You know if you can get grass-fed sort of um, meats and clean wild-caught fish. Um, wild-caught fish is actually cleaner than the farm fish because of the the farm fish just eat you know um, soy food and you know pellets and that sort of stuff. They don't. So sort of, yeah, there's they're very high in deuterium. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so actually, you might you might be interested in um, Dr. Sarah Pugh. Um, yeah, she's, I'm familiar with her. Yeah, she's amazing. Actually, she she talks a lot about uh, deuterium and uh, light. Also, you know, blue light from uh, it, it also affects our bodies yeah. quite a lot and our hormone production and things like that. So watching the computer screens a lot. Um, so. You, there are things that we can control, things that we can do. Um, so I think get yourself as, as healthy as you can metabolically so that you can, your body will deal with the things that you can't control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I will say um, I just recently got back um, my MRI results. So I went to Prenuvo. Uh, which is a full body scan. Um, it's no contrast, no dye. Um, it is unfortunately not covered by insurance because it's yeah. too healthy for us. Um, but um, I don't have any brain lesions anymore. That's incredible. I had 12 and now they're on. And I will tell you that 
um, just by implementing a ketogenic diet, we are seeing the same thing in MS and lupus. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, that's just what I keep saying. You know, the body is so resilient. If, as long as you get it healthy, you know, it will do the rest. You know, give it the right food. But what an amazing story you have come so far. Um, obviously, like on so many medications, brain lesions that, and early onset of dementia is such a young age and now you're running um so many things you, you're doing so much with you know uh, running these websites running these courses traveling so much and raising awareness helping people with cancer helping people in general with their metabolic health and you're lesion free on your you it's an it's incredible what a difference a high fat diet can make yeah yeah, yeah. I'm very fortunate to be on this journey. Um, I feel grateful for that diagnosis um, every day and um, really glad to be a part of, um, you know, a community. And I say a community because we have our community, but I think there are so many people like you that are bringing education and awareness to all of this. And if we can just all come together, right. And really be loud voices and get the information out there. I mean, it's just, we have such an opportunity in front of us right now. And I think people, you know, especially after COVID um, people want to learn, they want to hear more. I think their ears are a little bit more open to understanding it. I think there was just so many things that played out during COVID that made us realize that wait, some things just aren't adding up, you know? Um, the other thing that I will say too, is that um, I no longer have osteo. Um, and that showed up on my pre nuvo as well. And I think a lot of that is because I learned that I needed more vitamin D. Yeah. You know, yeah. and D is what carries calcium to our bones. But because I was so um, nutrient deprived and I had so many um, dysbiosis and malabsorption issues. Um, so I wasn't really absorbing vitamin D well when it hit my skin. Um, and then I have to supplement with it. Yeah, well, that's another good point too. Vitamin D helps us with so many things. It's a hormone that you know produced from test uh, from uh, cholesterol. So um, you know what interferes with that is a high carb diet as well. You know, the high carb diets you you um, produce less cholesterol, so you produce less um, hormones such as uh, vitamin D. And that disrupts absorption for you know, uh, so many other things, um, in, including your proteins. And like, your bones are made up mostly of, of collagen. Um, and you, that, that's how they stay strong and flexible. And um, another really interesting point on that, and this is just kind of a fun fact for people that are worried about skin cancer, is the reason we get skin cancer is because the, the, the sun hits us and our skin can't absorb it. Our yeah. skin can't absorb it when our omega sixes are high. Exactly. So yeah, which you can. Yeah, you know, yeah. Your high, high omega sixes, analytic acid, and things like that uh, come from seed oils. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the seed oils in absolutely every processed food, and even in foods that uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't think need that much process, like um, beef jerky, for example. Um, a lot of them you'll see if you read the ingredients there'll be like soy enhanced proteins and things like that um this is one thing that people need to understand as well they need to read the ingredients not the calorie charts the calorie chart it means nothing you know the and a lot of these calorie charts will say oh it's 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 got all these vitamins and minerals and stuff like that these are manufactured uh, fake vitamins and minerals that your body can't use and or to read the ingredients because um, you know basically everything is full of these machine oils such as soy and canola oil and all these other uh, high omega-6 um, basically uh, machinery oils um, so it's it's really about the ingredients, about the nutrients, not the calories. And, uh, you know, this is what disrupts your hormone production. And, you, you know, obviously you need vitamin D for your immune system as well. And it's also acts as a, as a sunscreen, it's a natural body sunscreen. When you, when you go out in the sun, your liver produces more 
uh, and your cholesterol produces more vitamin D and it sort of comes out in the skin and protects you from the sun. Yeah. I remember, um, like before, on a low-fat diet and low uh, and my cholesterol levels were so low, I would get sunburn very, very easily. And like basically, I could sit in the living room with the curtains open and get sunburn. That's how bad it was. Yeah. But now I, I can spend all day out in the sun. Yeah. And I, I have no no sunburn at all. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a huge it's difference. Pretty crazy, you know, it's, and it's hard to get people's mindset to shift. You know, we've been told, I mean, these are all of the things that we've been told are so bad for us for so long. Um, yeah. you know, sun and, and salt and sodium, like that, that mm -hmm. drives me crazy. Low sodium, low salt. And I'm like, oh, really? Doing too many carbs and sugar, you know, you're, you're kind of on the standard American diet. It's all of these things, you know, where we're putting all the sunscreen on us that um, has all of these chemicals, we're absorbing it that way. And so, you know, you try to wrap people's mind around, look, I actually need you to go in the sun without sunscreen at least 15 minutes a day, take it in, eat healthy foods, and you will be amazed. You know, yeah. you're not going to burn. You're not going to get skin That's cancer. That's another good point is, you know, we are basically solar powered, you know, um, and, you know, grounding is another great thing to do too. You, you know, you get that uh, electromagnetic energy coming through uh, the ground into your body it really helps you as well. You know, I, you know, 70% of our energy comes from this, the sun and grounding. So we, we need to be in touch with the, the planet. We need to be in touch with our environment, our natural environment, as much as possible. Um, and it, it, that, it's a very difficult thing to do, but we need to try and mimic a, a natural life as much as we can. Um, and there are ways we can do it. Like I said before, blocking blue light, for example, computer screens, TV screens, and things like that. Do some grounding, um, be out in the sun, and eat the right food, real whole food. Um, it's as natural. The basics. Yeah, it's 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 really not as difficult as it sounds. It, it's much easier than you think, um, and it's you know the diet side of things is actually incredibly simple. Really, yeah, you don't have to worry about calories. You just have yeah. to eat the right food. Yeah, know? and what um, if you, what if you took your shoes off and went instead stood on your grass or your dirt for fifteen minutes a day? I mean, that costs nothing. And That's right. it doesn't take any energy. It's very relaxing. You could just sit and watch the cars pass by or the trees or whatever. Mm. Well, um, I will put all the links um, to uh, your websites and your YouTube channel and uh, all the information in the description for everyone to uh, check this out. So everyone, please go check this out. Uh, have a look at anyone that you may know. It is it just metabolically unhealthy. It doesn't matter if it, you know they have cancer or anything else. Um, yeah, just send them along to go check out their information because it really is just fantastic work that they are doing. And you know, look at the story. Like Cindy's story is absolutely amazing. You, you go from such a, a horrible uh, diagnosis and, and prognosis for the future to look at her now. She's thriving. I mean, she looks mid thirties. She's, you know, strong as strong as ever, and living life and doing so much more. So, um, this can be, you know, this can happen for everyone. You know? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to seeing what we can do together. Yeah, that would be great. Um, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it, Cindy. So, hopefully, we can help get that story out.